My name is Serbi Singh, and I'm an executive recruiter here with Oregon Department of Human Services. I use she, her pronouns. Um, welcome to the informational session for our Child Welfare Deputy Director position. Uh, I'm so glad everybody is here. Um, today we'll uh, be learning more about this position. Uh, uh, just a simple agenda for today. Uh, we'll uh, uh, you know, hand it over to the hiring manager, our child welfare director, um, April, um, who's here with us today, um, hear from her and the team, and we'll uh, learn about the recruitment processes um, and the vision for this role, and we'll um, open it out uh, for Q&A, um, any questions about this position, um, the structure, um, the recruitment processes, and timeline. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so once um, this is done, I will send out um, all the relevant resources, the link to this recording session, uh, position description, um, and any other information um, regarding this recruitment. Uh, we do have uh, both uh, card services scheduled and I'm waiting for our ASL interpreter, uh, but we have these scheduled. Um, with this, uh, I will um, hand it over to um, April. Good morning. Um, it is good to uh, well see some 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 black boxes today. I can't see too many faces, um, but that's okay. Uh, my name is April Flint Gurner. She, her pronouns. Uh, I am the Oregon Department of Human Services uh, Child Welfare Director. Really excited to have folks joining us today um, to hear a little bit more about uh, what we're looking for in this Child Welfare Deputy Director. Um, I wanted to take some time um, to um, first talk a little bit about the Child Welfare Division. Uh, where we are, give you all a little bit of information um, about kind of the, the the path that we're on, and then I wanted to talk a little bit um, about what I'm looking for in a deputy, what we're looking for in a deputy to support our vision, and then we obviously wanted to leave an opportunity for some questions. So if you can't see the screen, that's okay. I am going to be um, sharing a couple of slides, um, but I will talk through them, um, and that is just fine. Real quick. I think I can share. There we go. So I am, um, let me see, and Serbi, you can let me know if you all can just see slides yes. or you see, okay, beautiful. Yep. Um, so perfect. as I mentioned, um, the Child Welfare Division is one of several divisions within the Oregon Department of Human Services. Uh, we serve one in three Oregonians as a, as a state agency. Um, the Child Welfare Division is um, the largest program within ODHS and ODHS. If we are not the largest state agency, we are um, close to being the largest state agency. Um, we, in uh, 2020, uh, we started on a path towards not only trying to make it through a global pandemic, um, but developing a vision for transformation of child welfare. Um, if you don't know a lot about child welfare um, already, um, I, you know, forgive me, I will, I will say, share a few things about the history of child welfare because it's important context in terms of how we've been trying to evolve um, our system. We are not trying to um, be the child welfare of old. Uh, we are not trying to be the child welfare that you have seen maybe in the media um, or that you have historically heard about in Oregon or across the country. Uh, we began the process of trying to transform um, child welfare in Oregon. Um, when I joined the state uh, around that time, when I joined the state with our previous child welfare director, um, I was in this role that I'm recruiting for um, it, from uh, March of 2020, uh, I started in the role a day after moving to the state. 
uh, and the global pandemic uh, shut us all down. So that was a great welcome. Um, I, I can't promise you that if any of you are the successful candidate that that won't be your first day, but I sure as heck hope not. It was not a fun way to come into the role. But the previous child welfare director said, April, I want you to build our capacity um, around equity and workforce development. And so I created the role, right? Like I came in and said, these are the things um, that I want to bring to this transformation. Um, we know that this, this role is going to play a key part in continuing that vision, but it also has some room for growth um, for the successful candidate to bring other um, perspectives and skill sets um, into the balance of our executive leadership team. Um, and so this is representative of, um, of what I, where I took the role. Um, and I'm really excited to see um, where the next successful candidate um, um, for this is going to take uh, this role to the, to the uh, next level. So in 2020, we started that vision for transformation. It was really grounded in these um, kind of guiding values and focus, a focus on racial equity um, and anti-racism, um, the spirit of what we believe a child welfare system can be and should be in Oregon. Child welfare as a division is not the child welfare system. We have a rightful role that we need to play in the child welfare system and the child well being system. And part of that vision for transformation is making sure that we are playing the rightful role that we should be in the broader child serving system. Um, our vision was created in collaboration with our workforce, with partners, and with Oregon tribes. The three guiding principles of that vision are around supporting families and promoting prevention. And I want to say a little bit about that. When we're talking about prevention, we are both talking about the prevention of child abuse and maltreatment. We are also talking about the prevention of children unnecessarily entering the foster care system. Our goal is not to grow the foster care system. Our goal is to help to make sure that we're working with the broader child serving system to make sure that children and families get what they need so we can avoid crisis in the first place. Foster care is not the place for children to grow up. Um, we firmly believe that. We know that there are some children that need to experience separation from their families. And when that happens, can we get them home quickly? Can we make sure that our services and supports are being offered um, to community with dignity, empathy, respect, and an adherence to anti-racism and equity and accessibility and belonging? Um, and can we help to prevent uh, maltreatment from happening again, meaning um, are we helping to make sure that they're connected with the right resources to prevent um, children from re-entering the, uh, the foster care system unnecessarily? So that prevention focus is really primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, um, that we are in the conversation with the broader child serving system, with anti-poverty programs, with our provider network, um, OHA, Oregon Health Authority, um, and a broad um, number of system partners in promoting um, the stability um, of Oregonian communities. The second guiding principle is enhancing our staff and infrastructure. And this is really, this deputy is like all in guiding principle too. This is, this is, this is your ball, right? This is how are we really making sure that we have a diverse, competent, confident, supported, and engaged workforce? How are we grounding our work in equity um, and a full equity framework? Uh, and um, obviously, do we have the infrastructure to support the people doing the work? And what I mean by infrastructure, I'm talking about things like are we managing our positions and our staffing allocations? Do we have a caseload standard um, that really helps us to articulate the, 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 the quantity and the quality of the work um, that each one of our people should be managing at any given time? Are we managing effective relationships with the unions, um, with labor, uh, with our partners? Are we centering and grounding everything we do in the voice of the community um, and looking at, um, being accountable for equitable outcomes. So enhancing our staff and infrastructure is about people resources. It is about processes. It is about workforce development. It is about equity. It's about all of those things. And the third guiding principle is really about how we're enhancing our system to use data 
um, so that we can continue to be a, a learning organization. Um, do we have quality data? Is it helping us to be more accountable to communities? Is it helping us to be transparent about areas where we need to continue to grow and change um, and areas where we are seeing signs of success? Um, and so guiding principle number three is about not data driven decisions, but data informed decisions and really making sure that we are building implementation capacity um, to um, get to good outcomes for children and families. Um, if you know anything about big systems and child welfare in particular, we're really good at coming up with good ideas. We're not necessarily great at implementing them. And how are we using um, continuous quality improvement and quality assurance and implementation strategies um, to make sure that we um, at any given time, we know why we're doing things. We know what we're doing. We are able to implement things with fidelity. We're able to measure success and communicate effectively to the people that hold us accountable, um, what we're doing with public resources, um, et cetera. Um, and I, we, we will have time for questions in the end, and I'm sure you all have some questions about this, but this is, this is the foundation of our work. This is the foundation of our work and anyone who is coming to serve on this team needs to um, at least be able to articulate how their experience, their education, their passion um, can help us contribute to this vision. This vision is not going to change. <laughs> the thing that will change about the vision will maybe the how. Um, some of the vision may evolve as we continue to um, evolve, right? Any, any real good vision, it's, you know, we're not gonna have a done day, right? We're gonna continue to focus on prevention. We're gonna continue to invest in our staff. We're gonna continue to use data to help inform how we make good decisions. And so it will be really important for anyone interested in this position to be able to talk about those three things. A little bit about how we are organized. Um, we have community facing programs and then we have our operations and policy. Um, I will talk a little bit about the whole state infrastructure in just a moment, uh, but we have our Oregon child abuse hotline, our child safety program, our permanency program, youth transitions, treatment services, foster care, fatality prevention and review, our resource parent retention and recruitment and our health and wellness teams. Those are all teams of people with high level management managers over them. Um, our deputy directors oversee both um, those lead program areas as well as child welfare across the state um, in our delivery system. And I, again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, within our central office or what we call our design team is also our operations and policy folks. So we've got the interstate compact for the placement of children, our federal state um, policy team, um, our business operations contracts, um, and our case management system or our technology um, case management system, which is ORCIDS. We have our equity training and workforce development team, as well as our continuous quality improvement team that kind of sit between these groups of people and teams um, to help represent uh, the division. Um, who we are, we are um, a part of the larger ODHS family. Um, we are working together to try to build strong communities and families. We are trying to prioritize children remaining with their families, returning to their families, um, and we are supporting um, all things that contribute to less abuse and neglect. Um, and some of that is really anchored in our partnership with our anti-poverty programs and with um, our public health partners. Um, and so this role will play a key um, kind of uh, 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 represent some key work um, connected to system integration, um, and work across these systems as we look at poverty's impact um, on families and communities, um, as we look at um, disparate health outcomes on communities that impact ultimately um, the number of children that experience child abuse in our state and in our nation. Um, and then I wanted to just say a little bit about um, this, you know, if you've heard anything about child welfare before, um, and our history and, and some of our legacy and, and reputation nationally and across the state. We've been known to be punitive and paternalistic, um, to have a lack of an equity lens and a lack of implementation capacity. Again, that doesn't mean we are, we are bad people or that we have, you know, that we don't have good ideas. Um, but that 
It's just the way that the system has been shaped. Now we're really working on investment in our workforce and resource families, um, trying to share power with community, um, engaging our tribal and community partners, using more data informed strategies, um, and don't even worry about ORCA transformation, but really transforming the way that we work with the broader community to really understand what is child welfare's role in the broader child serving system, because the front door of child welfare is our child abuse hotline. And if our child abuse hotline isn't operating the way that it needs to operate, then it makes it really tough um, to transform any other parts of the system. Um, and so we really started with the ORCA transformation um, and we are really looking at um, uh, implementing transformational um, transformational efforts across every single component of child welfare, but the ORCA transformation was first. Our new reality where we're hoping to go is that we are really highly um, grounded in preservation um, and prevention, as I talked about before, that we're operating from an understanding um, tools and skills connected to a full equity framework, that we really are community driven in terms of um, voice, choice, and power and that we have built implementation capacity. Um, one of the things that I just wanna mention is that the broader ODHS mission, um, we are a part, again, yes, we're a big division, but we are a part of the broader um, Oregon Department of Human Services. And here are some of the key things that are priorities um, for ODHS is about strong and thriving communities. Um, and so we contribute to that in the Child Welfare Division by supporting children to grow up safe and, nurt and nurturing in their family home when at all possible, that we are really looking at opportunities to grow our capacity for youth with specialized needs, um, that we are a part of the responding agencies that have to support communities when there are pandemics and wildfires and other emergencies, um, and that we certainly are preparing children um, to have a bright future we really do play a strong role in ODHS around those things. And then um, that um, some of the ways that that looks, um, ODHS is really focused on three things right now, just strengthening our foundations, which really then says things like, we're grounding all of our work in equity. We're trying to focus on um, uh, operational efficiencies, development of workload models, um, those kinds of things. Are we are we are we nimble and yet efficient? Um, that we are able to prepare for and respond to emergencies, and that we are transforming human services. Those things on the right are just a couple of examples of how child welfare is answering that call. Um, I, I'm not going to get into um, all the things about Oracle and Orca. Um, and the mobile crisis unit, but we've talked a little bit about the vision for transformation. Um, and should you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions about family first. Lastly, who we serve um, and how we're structured as a state. There are 36 counties in Oregon. We serve the nine tribes of Oregon, as well as tribal nations who have children in our care that are outside of Oregon. We serve children, young adults, and their families. We serve our resource families. So if you're wondering what that means, that's formerly foster families and caregivers. We um, serve community partners and we serve our provider network. Um, this is a map of our staff um, and our organization. We have 16 districts that we support as well as the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline, which is centralized. It's physically uh, located in the Portland Metro area, but it serves the entire state. Um, we actually have, I think, more positions than that. I would say about when it's all said and done, we'll have about 25, 2,600 positions um, here, uh, 30, I mean, 35, I know I say 25, 3,500 positions um, within child welfare as a division. So quite a few staff. Uh, we have about 4,000, over 4,000 foster parents that we support, and there are roughly 4,500 children in care that we support. Uh, we have 74 offices, including our central office, district branch, satellite, and family time locations. Um, and just, I'm going to go back one slide so you all know what this says. Um, we have the lowest number of children in foster care in 17 years, and that is a great thing. Kids don't do well growing up in foster care. We are committed 
to continuing to try to reduce the number of children that need to experience foster care in, in order to experience safety. Um, and we're really looking forward to um, continuing um, to build data-driven strategies, um, increase our use of culturally relevant supports, improving our policies and our procedures, enhancing our workforce development, deepening our engagement with communities, retaining and recruiting diverse staff and leaders, um, supporting strong leadership, um, and enhancing training at all um, levels to help us continue um, to see those numbers of children in care continue to go down and for us to be able to serve more kids in home. A little bit about um, the position. So as I mentioned, I held this position for a few years. I became the permanent child welfare director in July. Um, I've been operating as interim child welfare director almost for the last two years. Um, some of you may know that our previous child welfare director got a promotion. Uh, she went to go be the commissioner um, for the administration for children, youth and families under the Biden administration. And because she had to go through full Senate confirmation, um, it, it wasn't like one day she was gone and the next I was here. I had to kind of operate as interim child welfare director while she was the director because at any moment she could have been confirmed and would be gone. Um, so um, I have been operating basically for over a year as both interim director and the deputy director. Um, and so really, really looking forward to getting this position filled. Um, a couple of things that I'm really looking for um, in this role. So first and foremost, being a part of the executive leadership team for child welfare. This is an executive leadership role, which means the ideal candidate has got an ex years of management experience, managing large budgets, managing large numbers of people, um, developing large scale executive level strategic direction um, for organizations or districts, um, working um, directly with um, agency heads, legislators, um, you know, directors of, 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 of agencies, those kinds of things. This is an executive level position. We are expecting that this person, we will function alongside the other members of the executive leadership team as we interface with the governor's office, as we interface with the legislature, as we interface with the public, large entities, national organizations, tribes, tribal leaders in government to government relationships. Um, we have, um, a lot of mandates in child welfare, federal, state, legal, there's all kinds of mandates. The executive leader on this team will be interfacing at the highest levels of government connected to those mandates and those responsibilities. Um, this role um, needs to be able to demonstrate a high level of executive leadership acumen and business acumen. Um, they need to be able to operate from a place of dignity and diplomacy because of the political environment that this role will be involved in. Um, we are, as a child welfare division, as all state agencies, we are, um, we are employed at the pleasure of the governor. That means that we are not representing our own views. We are um, representing the governor's views and the views of the director of this agency. Um, and so in doing so, um, this role has to have a high, a high degree of diplomacy and comfort in interfacing with a lot of people who have a lot of, di a lot of different opinions about what needs to happen with child welfare, um, including the legislature um, on all camps. Um, this role is really going to be um, key in leading um, teams of people. Uh, like I mentioned with 3,500 staff, we have about, I think just over 300 people in central office. This role serves in direct leadership over teams within central office. And so we'll share the responsibility of supervising high level leaders. Um, so what I mean by that, um, I will give for an example, um, uh, the one uh, manager position that this role will certainly supervise is the, um, 
the senior manager over equity training and workforce development. I believe that team has 40 something people on it. This person is probably going to supervise four or five of those kinds of people. So <laughs> lots of people um, are going to be under their hierarchy, um, very large budget responsibilities. And quite frankly, my expectation is that this role is going to support me in the development of leaders in making sure that we are setting child welfare on a strategic course around a full workforce development framework. And what I mean by that is pre-recruitment activities um, and partnerships with universities, setting up, um, you know, whatever we need to do in the way of contracting um, and support um, with our university partners to make sure that every corner of the state um, has access to workforce development supports, that we are doing um, best practices in selection and hiring and recruitment of every kind of workforce uh, uh, level in the state. So it's not just case managers um, that do day-to-day um, -day practice with families. It's every single layer of this um, child welfare agency needs to have workforce development. So which is why it's going to be really important that this person have significant leadership experience because they are going to be setting the strategic direction um, for high level managers um, and ensuring that there are resources to support their development of managers, of supervisors, of office staff, of every single person that works in child welfare. Um, and they will have, they will play a significant role in helping to partner with self-sufficiency program as well in the development of their staff um, for a few reasons. The way that our districts are um, organized, our district managers across those 16 districts supervise both self-sufficiency and oversee self-sufficiency and child welfare. And so when we're talking about the development of the workforce, although this role organizationally sits in child welfare, they will be playing a key role in the development of the 2000 staff that work in self-sufficiency as well. So just really setting us up for more integration across self-sufficiency and child welfare as we think about deep engagement with communities, centering our work on prevention and equity, those kinds of things. Um, also, we'll be helping to execute um, the training and workforce development full framework that we've started, um, which, you know, is, is a big deal um, because I think historically we have tried to train our way to best practice, um, and that's really not what works. It's really about skill development and coaching, having a variety of um, um, uh, formats and opportunities across the spectrum of adult learning for very busy staff to be able to gain skill. And that's really hard to do in child welfare because our staff are too busy to go to training, right? And so it's really about being creative um, and thinking about how do we make sure that we are getting just in time um, transfer of learning skill-based opportunities out to the districts and ways that are accessible, that are technologically advanced um, and that are leveraging um, our partners in really effective ways. We don't have enough trainers for every single um, piece and part of the state. And so it really is about strategizing to balance both the university partners, our contractors, um, our support roles that provide training and support to our staff, um, as well as our central office team. Uh, we are also implementing a statewide coaching model uh, across self-sufficiency and child welfare. This deputy director will be involved um, in leading and accountable for the implementation um, of both the coaching model, um, the, the agency succession planning work, our leadership development work, on, and of course, because of the focus on equity, the implementation of a full equity framework. Um, it's going to be really, really important, y'all, as you prepare for, if you already, already, if you haven't already applied, um, or if you are going to be applying, um, that in your application materials and as you prepare for this, that you are preparing for an executive level role. Um, we are moving into agency strategic planning. 
we need to um, we've got work to do in terms of building out equitable contracting processes, partnering with a, our human resources team to build in equity and inclusion into all of our HR practices, and of course, the development of our staff to lead with equity. Um, and so I just want to make sure that it, you, you all are hearing me loud and clear um, that the successful candidate is going to be able to articulate their leadership acumen, their experience in, in, in moving and implementing large scale, high level efforts forward for, for workforce. Now, that doesn't mean that you had to do this for you know, 3000 people, um, but being able to talk about it in terms of the le of the the teams that you have worked with, the teams that you have led and supported are going to be really, really important. And then the last thing I will say is I'm really looking for good balance on our executive leadership team. Uh, we are a great bunch. I am super proud to work with this group. I'm really sad that you all couldn't meet uh, the other executive leadership uh, team members, but they're off executive leader leadering <laughs> um, today. There is um, on our executive leadership team, um, the peer to this role, uh, Lacey Andreessen is the other deputy director. And um, she is busy engaging with tribes right now. And so she couldn't be here today to answer questions directly from her role. But my hope is that I can hush in a moment and take your questions because I did sit in this role and I can answer questions about what this looks like every day. Our chief of uh, business operations, um, our deputy chief of strategy and innovation and our deputy, um, no, we changed the name, our deputy director of strategy and innovation, our assistant deputy of strategy and innovation um, and our assistant deputy over program and practice. Um, so we've got, you would balance us out. Um, we would end up being a, a team of six. Uh, we have a few folks who provide executive support as well that are a part of our uh, executive leadership team. Um, and we are a feisty, passionate group of folks. Um, we are really committed to this vision for transformation and transforming the way that child welfare interacts with the community. Um, we are passionate about taking care of our staff. Um, and we are um, fierce about um, wanting to make sure that we create sustainable uh, change. I think what's missing on our team right now, um, we are really looking for more organization. Um, we are looking for, um, and I don't know that it's missing, but it's important to me that I can trust that the deputy, if I'm not in the room, that they can represent the vision for transformation in me um, in, 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 in all of the work. Our executive leadership team, we function as a team in the leadership of this division. And so, um, you know, maturity, cultural humility, um, all of those things are really, really important because our reputation is on the line. And we're working really hard to try to bring more transparency and accountability to the community and being a good team player, knowing when, um, knowing when to lean in and when to back off is really important. And quite frankly, you're supervising district managers, right? You're supervising district managers and high level leaders across the state. And so being able to both be a customer service um, focused leader um, to our district managers who do the hardest work um, out there in the delivery system, as well as still um, providing leadership direction uh, is a hard thing. And so I really need someone that can balance both um, with compassion and accountability, dignity and respect for the hard work that the workforce is doing, um, but still who's not willing to hard, who's not willing to shy away from making hard decisions when hard decisions need to be made because they need to be made every day. Um, I feel like I've talked enough about the division, the organization, what I'm looking for, and I'm really, really curious about questions that you all have. Feel free to come off mute, feel free to come on camera, feel free to throw them in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with.
Oh, thank you. Um, Serby put in the links in the chat to the Child Welfare Division site, um, our Equity North Star and our Rise Culture, all of which um, are going to be really key and important um, parts of this work and role. And also it looks like uh, put the external job application in. Beautiful. Questions? Um, and I want to add, as you know, April mentioned, um, please, please carefully review the job announcement. We are looking for complete application materials to learn fully about you. Uh, there's, we want to see every single transferable skill attribute you're bringing in for this role. Um, if you look like the qualifications, we're looking at seven years of management experience or four years of management experience with a bachelor's degree. Um, this is a requirement that Department of Administrative Services has set uh, for this classification. But with this, we're looking for essential attributes um, such as the visionary leadership, diversity, equity, um, and inclusion, working with that lens, program knowledge of child welfare division, um, or from your background, innovation, stewardship, business acumen, accountability, community partnership, um, and um, community engagement, leadership management style, servant leadership, and um, overall communication with internal external teams. So please, please, please make sure that you are uh, putting in details around how you bring in um, the skills, the qualifications for this role, um, and a complete application material, um, a full resume, um, and your cover letter. I see a hand up for a question, so um, I hand up to you. Yes, I wanted to ask about the management experience. Um, people coming from various professions into the applicant pool um, running a pediatric practice for many years and being on a university faculty, um, do you consider that management or does it need to be at the state level? Obviously, within a university system, you had to manage grants, you had to manage a faculty, you had to manage students, you had to manage um, complex patient care. Are those considered essential qualities or do you need to have, um, you know, a degree in, um, in management? I will answer from my perspective, that absolutely counts. <laughs> um, now, let me tell you a little bit about the process. There are people that are gonna be reviewing these applications for um, these um, require <coughs> requirements prior to them coming to an interview panel. So it's gonna be really important that you articulate your definition of management experience um, well, if you think there could be any question about that. Thank you. And we want to hear, um, that's why in the, even if you look at the job announcement, um, we want to be as inclusive as possible and it's an evolving, uh, aim for us when it comes to our announcements. We want to be inclusive um, as much as possible. So if you don't have government experience, nonprofit experience, or any transferable um, experience from your background, background history. So um, as April mentioned, you know, putting it and interpreting in the way how you meet that management, what have you done at that level? What kind of com complexity it, it involved, whether running the um, care or being in the university faculty, and how would you bring in those transferable skills? So this, this does count. I just got a text message. Lacey is actually on with us. Um, so Lacey, Lacey is on the phone. So Lacey, I wondered, sorry to put you on the spot, but you probably know better than anybody what the day-to-day -day of this role looks like and what we're really looking for. Um, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to this group. Um, you've got about where's nine, nine, ten folks on this call. Thank you, April. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lacey Andreessen. I use she, pronoun she her pronouns as the deputy director for child welfare. It was fun to hear April say nice things about me when she didn't know I was here. Uh, I have been um, with the Department of Human Services professionally for my entire career. I started as a caseworker and then a supervisor in a local delivery branch, moved into our central office team and have carried a variety of roles. I've been in this position for well over three years. April and I started um, really close together with Rebecca. I would say, you know, 
know, these are big jobs. They're also really inspiring jobs. I, if you would have told me many years ago in the state our agency was in that I would be a deputy director, I probably would have strongly disagreed. And because of leaders like April and Rebecca, I have been in this job and been able to keep this job. And we're, you know, I think April said it really well. We are looking for someone to help balance. Um, we have two social workers who really understand child welfare and who understand child welfare in this state. And so some of those other skills that she talked about, I think will be um, something I will really be looking for organizationally with the workforce development, each of those things help continue the growth that we've made. We had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago in an exercise for planning to reflect back on six years ago when we went through a federal audit in preparation for the federal audit that's coming up next year. And I was kind of blown away by the amount of progress that we've made and the amount of change that we've implemented. And so my hope is to find another person for our team who's willing to keep that momentum going. Um, it, it is a job that's pretty simple. Your days can change quickly because uh, there's a lot of people who can set priority. But the better that we do about setting the road and staying on the road, the less likely we will be to be swayed off of that by things like changes in a governor or a bad media story or pressure from the legislature or the union. Those are all places where we feel and have historically done kind of knee-jerk reactions to things and we're really working to have our staff feel consistency and stability and leadership and know what our goal and our mission is so that we don't get swayed by some of the stuff that just happens. So I apologize I couldn't be virtually on screen with you in the room. I'm driving south to attend the Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council tomorrow. Um, so that's why I'm not there, but really looking forward to getting to know any of you um, in the interview process. And I would be also happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Lacey. One would think that I would know the end of her phone number by now. <laughs> the other thing I just wanted to say is, you know, we do really serious work. Um, child abuse is not a light uh, field to be in, but we do like to have a good time. We do. We do like to spend time with one another and we work really hard, but we find ways to create joy and laughter the best we can. Um, and so I, you know, one, I couldn't be prouder um, to work with the amazing group of leaders that we have across this state. They are phenomenal. Um, you won't find a more dedicated, passionate, a uh, silly group of people. Um, and so I just wanted to throw that out there too, that it is, yeah, it's a lot of work, but but we do find our ways um, to take care of one another because if we don't take care of one another in child welfare, you know, nobody else is going to. Um, and we have an exceptional reputation nationally at this point um, with our colleagues um, across, the, across the country. Um, we are really in a cutting edge space. And so we're really excited about this opportunity to have um, our next deputy really be a part of putting Oregon continually out there on the map. And I think those places of innovation and creativity are really around um, our alignment with anti-poverty programs, um, our work we're, we're um, leading around equity. Um, we are, absolutely standing out in the nation around our family preservation efforts. And so there are a lot of days where there are really, really hard things to deal with. And there are a lot of days where there are tears of joy um, because we are seeing our work work. We are building stronger teams. We are supporting one another. Um, we're having a good time. Um, so I just wanted to throw those kind of anecdotal things out there about what it, what it feels like to be um, on this team. We've talked enough. I really am curious what your questions are about either the application process or things that we're looking for. Um, there's more time here to answer those kinds of questions than there will be in the interview process. Hey, April, I have a question. This is Molly Miller. Um, now that you're in your current role, <coughs> excuse me, looking back at your 
previous time, and I mean, obviously you're still doing this role as well. If there was one piece of advice that you could give the applicant stepping into this job, what would it be? Build relationships with the district managers. <laughs> um, build relationships with, with tribes and community as soon as you can. Build relationships with members of the legislature, the governor's office, the director's office. So much of this role is about relationship building. Um, and I felt like I got robbed of some of that because my day one was the, first, the day we started to shut down as a state. And I feel like I'm just now in some ways getting to build those relationships. Um, I think the other thing is if you do not have a committed community of support and your own personal well-being practice, you won't make it. It's too hard. It's just too hard. It is, it can be really, really stressful to be in the public eye the way that we are, to hear about really bad things happening to kids and to be supporting a staff that is traumatized and hurt and tired. And so you got to find ways to take care of yourself. And if you don't have those practices in place, um, you, you won't mind working with the people. It won't even be the, it'll just be the, the cumulative stress of it all if you don't create that space for work-life balance in, in those ways. Because I think we're all really, really flexible and understanding and like we're I'm not looking for somebody who you know needs to beat me to work and stay out until I'm not expecting people to do that I expect people to spend time with their kids and go to the football games and cook dinner for their families and take off when you're sick and all of those things because this job and the stress of the job are going to continue whether you're at work or not and so I think had I focused more on relationships and really developed the self-care strategies that I needed from day one. <laughs> I wouldn't need to have palm trees in the background of my, of my Zoom. So that that was a good question. I appreciate that, Molly. I don't know, Lacey, what is your what are your thoughts? I think those were really fair responses, April. I think the other thing is too that just probably needs to be said in case you haven't kind of asserted, this is not an eight to five Monday through Friday job. It's not always an 80 hour a week job, but it is sometimes evening, weekends. Um, we do a lot of work with the tribes. We do work with community partners. We go out and do presentations with folks like judges at conferences. And so just knowing that I think is important. Um, the other thing is we will probably continue about 80% remote, but again, on any given week that can vary. Um, just depending on what's on the schedule and, and what we have going on. Thank you, Lacey. I see a hand up. Hi. The, the media has not necessarily been kind to child welfare, uh, especially when they criticize some of the placements, especially in not resource homes, but in hotels and other things. How, how does your leadership plan to create a much more positive view among Oregon media? It's nice that Oregon stands out nationally, but we also have to stand out within our own state. And handling the media, uh, encouraging more and more resource families, engaging not only tribal leaders, tribal councils, encouraging resource parents within tribal communities um, and all across Oregon, especially Eastern and Southern Oregon seems to be critical to make this job really, um, I would say more universally applicable to all Oregonians. I think you're spot on. Um, it, you saw me smile when you asked the question, because a key piece of this role is going to be about helping us around the, the development of our comm strategy. Our external comm strategy needs a lot of work, period. There's a lot of good stories 
there really are a lot of good stories. We can't yet get people to pick those good stories up. And so trying to really change the face of child welfare is really about getting up the partners to say things about us that the community won't believe from us directly. And so that's why part of this role is so um, key around community engagement and communications um, because we have not always had the best calm strategy when it comes to telling a story other than the story that child welfare um, you know, is the bad guy. And so what, and I think that contributes to um, the trauma of the workforce because they know they're going out and doing good work every day and nobody will tell the story for them, right? Um, so I think, not that I, not that I think, part of the direction of the vision for transformation isn't just about those three guiding principles. It's about how do we communicate effectively and partner with people who can communicate for us how we're living into that vision and how we are showing and proving. Again, the national world can hear, can see it and hear it, but Oregon isn't seeing it yet. And, and we really are going to have to work hard as a team together um, to, to and work with our comms folks in the governor's office and all of those things. This role will be deeply um, partnering with all of us to um, to help to change that narrative and be accountable. <laughs> it's not just about changing a narrative. It's about living differently. It's about being different um, and helping to tell the story of the positive things that are happening. And there are a lot of, hap of those happening. But to be honest with you, um, I think there are a lot of folks that don't want to tell the good stories. And so we have been trying to look into and doing our research as well about um, where are the places where we have some good partnerships that can help us tell that story that want to tell a good story about child welfare? Love the question. So may, maybe a couple more minutes for questions, and then I think there's a, um, Serby's going to end us off with some, some things about your application process. I have a Thank you. Quick, quick question about the team. Um, you mentioned about telling the story of the agency and and creating kind of the agency brand, right? Um, something that where you've been and where you are now, and also controlling the narrative about what's going on out there about you, about the the agency's objective and and direction. Is there someone that's, I guess, do you have a designated person on the team that is more? versed in those communication strategies or is this a team effort a little bit of both so we have a, a comms team um, as a part of our director's office um, group um, we have two folks on our comms team that are um, kind of dedicated to supporting child welfare we have one full-time person who is our comms liaison and then her her boss is a um very experienced comms strategist um, and worked in national media um, for quite some time. And so really, we've just started to um, get to the tip of the iceberg around um, how to best leverage these roles. And we're really actually excited about some of the things that are coming. But it's actually my vision that this deputy is going to be the key um, liaison with that comms team and really helping to set that that um, that it's a community engagement strategy, right? This role is all about community engagement. And so really wanting that this deputy to be um, also the comms lead for the executive leadership team. So that's my hope. And it wasn't necessarily something that was my job when I was sitting in the role, but it is something that's missing um, from our internal team. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. All right, thank I, you. I would imagine Lacey would say the same. <laughs> Totally agree. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, I see. Ellen, I see your hand up. Yes. Oh, yeah. How do you see CCO 2.0 with their emphasis on behavioral medicine, behavioral interactions, meeting your fundamental principles of keeping families intact? And how do you relate to OHA in guiding CCOs to 
foster relationships that keep families intact? Wow, you've got great questions today. So I'll tell you, it's all a, it's all about partnership and I think aligned vision where we're putting the needs of children and families back into the center of the conversation. Um, we, you know, I think in government, we tend to build infrastructure and processes around, you know, mandates and policy and statute. And I'm not saying that that's not a part of the conversation, but do we build infrastructure and policy and relationships around the core outcome, which is that we want kids to be okay. Um, and we want kids and families to get what they need. And so we do have, and I really am curious if Lacey wants to chime in here for a minute, but um, I want to just call out the children's system of care is a um, is a space where we are working on those relationships across not just a OHA, um, but the provider network and everyone who is connected to um, trying to make sure that kids get what they need so they don't have to come into foster care um, in order to get it. And so, you know, our relationship with that is that children should not have to come into foster care to get what they need. And we don't have a magic door. We are not a service provider. We are a broker of services, just like any parent or guardian. And so if they don't exist in the world, then we are struggling like other folks to get there, but we can't afford to not leverage our, um, our collective power, the, 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 the authority that we have as child welfare to pull in funds um, and work across partnerships to make sure that families get what they need. And so, so much of the work of our teams, particularly our treatment services teams um, and some of our other folks in our family first prevention work um, are about strengthening those relationships across um, uh, our CCOs, across children's system of care, across OHA, um, to make sure that we are centering the needs of children and families, not, not getting lost in the, well, that's not my job, right? And so that's where there's this tension for child welfare, because I think sometimes when folks, when we say, hey, you all, we don't, we're not a service provider, children shouldn't have to come and experience the traumas of foster care to get what they need. I think what people hear is child welfare wants to throw up their hands. And so we are navigating this tense space but what I know is that there has never been more momentum than right now around the conversation that you just brought up. Um, and this, this person is gonna be sitting in those spaces with me and Lacey, um, continuing to build out um, the answers to that question. Lacey, I'm curious about your thoughts on that question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and if we had more time, we could talk about how it aligns with your question around temporary lodging and children in hotels. But I would say, um, in short, the spirit of CCO 2.0 is very much in alignment with the agency vision and our vision for transformation. The actualization is still a work in progress, and I would concur that I believe the right leaders are in place and the momentum is moving us in that direction. Thanks, Lacey. And I know, Serby, we gave you one minute. <laughs> <laughs> No worries at all. Thank you, for, uh, Lacey and April, for answering Ellen's question. And I appreciate you all for being here. Um, I mentioned a little um, in, in mid of this meeting, but again, if you, as we mentioned, we're looking for complete application materials. Um, so if you, I, if you haven't submitted it, I've put the um, application link in the chat. I've put my email address too. If there's any application materials uh, missing or if you have any difficulty about completing your application, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to upload your materials to your application. Um, well, after our meeting today, um, I will be sending out position description, all the resources I put in the chat, along with the recording link um, within this week um, to all our registrants. I'm glad we had this group. We had about 35 registrants, but I'm glad you all could make it and I'll send uh, them this link. Uh, with this, I am just a phone call and an email away if you have any questions in the meanwhile. This position closes on December um, 3rd. Um, that we will be um, doing application screening and any communication, um, all of the communication regarding next steps um, and updates would be um, coming from me through Workday. Uh, so I just wanted to deeply thank you all and I appreciate everyone's time. Big thank you, April and Lacey for being here today. I appreciate you both and thank you for all you do. I wish you all a great week ahead. Thanks everyone Thank for you. coming for your great questions and we look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you to everyone. It was, just, this was incredibly helpful.
Thank you, Chris. Take care. Bye-bye.